it's okay. Okay, so I think for me, occupational science has been uh, perhaps most fundamentally important in, in reviewing and bringing back into practice the concept of occupation. So if we think about where occupational therapy was in the early, the late 1970s and early 1980s, certainly in the UK where I was located, but also I think in America there was a real biomedical focus on di medical diagnoses and activities and techniques such as sensory integration and biomechanical approaches um, and I don't think it's by chance that occupational science was uh, being developed at that time and then we saw this re-emergence of occupation based practice, occupation as a focus of practice, as an aim of practice. So I think it's enabled us to expand practice, to consider occupational needs of people beyond medical needs. Um, so we can talk about somebody who is in a position of occupational deprivation, for example, uh, occupational imbalance, but also this idea that fundamentally we are dealing with people's occupational needs, which may be influenced by a medical diagnosis, but is not the core of our practice. Um, and so I think it's also in those terms then helps define our practice in terms of other professions and helps identify our core expertise. Uh, and I think that it certainly can, can be expanded over the next few years. You know, how, do we, how do we interview about occupational needs? How do we practice directed at in influencing needs both with individuals, families, communities? Um, and how do we publicize that, disseminate that information to service providers, governments, have it introduced into policy. Okay. So I think when I'm talking about occupational needs, I'm certainly basing those ideas on Wilcox, uh, theory of occupation, the, the article that she published in 1993, when she talks about uh, the need of people to do for survival. Uh, the need of people to, to be engaged in occupation in order to use their capacities and to use their abilities. Um, so with students, I use the I ask them if they've ever spent a, a lengthy period of time, perhaps in, in bed because of an illness, and how does that make them feel? And that urge that we get to, oh, I'm, I, I've been sitting for too long, I need to get up and do something, or um, you know, people want to, um, to read a book and, and to gain knowledge. Um, I think there's a, we, we often don't think about how much we're driven by a sort of a physical or mental sense of, of a need, a lack that we have. And also, um, I think the need that we have to be um, uh, for enjoyment and for pleasure and for satisfaction and whether that, and for, our, for expression. We need to express ourselves through relationships, through conversation, through music, through art, through creative forms, but also through, through cooking a meal for our family, we're also expressing and engaging in a, in a relationship with people. So I think there's, a, there's multiple needs that um, we have to be engaged in the world. And some of those are from our own internal needs, uh, to satisfy hunger, to satisfy, to, war, to be warm, to, to use our skills, but also obviously to address uh, demands of the environment. Demand things of us in a positive sense, whether it's our children or relatives to be cared for, or the work we're in demands certain behaviours. So, but needs primarily for me are internal, and I think a lot of our occupation comes from those needs. Yes, Thank you. So, going back or looking a little bit more at what is occupation, I think uh, I know there's an enormous debate about that in the, in the literature. Uh, and has changed throughout time, I think, our perception of occupation, but uh, where I think we're at at the moment and where I think is most useful is actually to think of occupation as everything that we do. Um, those things can be positive for us, so, and those are the ones we usually look at when we're helping a client or a patient reconstruct their life to support their health and well-being. But occupation can also be more negative um, for somebody. Uh, so that could be 
an occupation of, of perhaps working too much uh, or um, obviously say misuse of alcohol or drugs or, or different things like that but I think um, if, if we if we think of occupation as everything um, from having a conversation with somebody to taking a call on a mobile phone to patterns of occupation over long periods of time, that then helps us think about more clearly, but what are the parts, how do we understand the occupation that supports health and well-being? And <clears throat> some of that is very fundamental around survival needs. We have to be able to eat, drink, clothe ourselves, have friendships, have families, all those elements. Um, it may be things about meaning, though that's again a very complicated concept um, because actually everything has some kind of meaning and meaning can be negative. It's very meaningful to, to be in an abusive relationship but it's not health promoting. So again, what sort of meaning is, is helpful? Um, purpose, all these terms, then, then we can start to think about what is it in our culture, in our context, that supports people's health and well-being in what they do. Um, I think the other thing that helps if we think about occupation as everything is that we can see it as a very fluid process that goes on throughout life. We have moments when we are perhaps less balanced, you know, if a students are revising for examinations, they may be working seven hours a day or somebody's trying to finish a thesis, it's a very intense period of work, but we know that in a month or in two months we'll be able to go on holiday, we'll be able to do other things that will be restorative. And that's a very natural balance and we feel that in our lives. Or we spend <coughs> these five days at a conference, it's very busy, it's very intense, we then have this period of quiet and it balances it out. Um, so I think fluidity across the time, across our lifespan um, and occupation being everything is a really good starting point to then begin to think about, okay, which bits of that can support health and well-being. It's okay. I think I sort of would like to give maybe two examples of how I see clinical application of some of the concepts. So firstly, thinking of occupational justice. Um, which I understand to be thinking about how occupation is distributed um, across populations and people and contexts and whether that's in a just way in the sense of social justice and distribution. Um, and I, in, in clinical applications that seems to be useful in two um, perhaps ways at the moment in the United Kingdom. One is regarding particular um, groups of people, for example, in the prison system, people living in care homes, uh, people living in poverty, uh, refugees. To what degree is their ability to engage in occupation impacted by social conditions beyond their control? Um, and that's been useful, I think, for um, occupational therapists working in the clinical areas to begin to see their practice in terms of not the individual, um, but also what's the systems and how are they working. So whether that's, you know, how, are, how do care homes organise their daily activities for people and how can that be expanded to be more individualised or richer or more available because there are sometimes cases where very little is provided. Um, and I think the other place where there's an occupation focus and thinking about everything as an occupation is very useful is in conditions such as alcohol misuse and if we start thinking about drinking as an occupation, uh, that helps us then analyse well what are the conditions under which uh, drinking, and I'm certainly not talking about stopping drinking, but about at what point does that become problematic for somebody? Um, we're looking into moments of transition for older people, perhaps moving into retirement or returning into um, bereavement or loss in older age. And how does that seem to be triggering alteration in an occupational pattern that has been helpful up to that time? 
to thinking of drinking alcohol as a pattern that can be either can be health promoting and it can also though be quite damaging. What when does that change occur? How does it occur? And I think some of our work from occupational science is really valuable in understanding how people um, develop and shape their, their occupations at particular times and how that can change in the same way perhaps for people with eating disorders. We all eat, we all prepare food. How does it become a, 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 a non-health promoting occupation? Um, so I think that, um, that, I, that those are two, two particularly useful examples certainly in the occupational therapy context of the United Kingdom at the moment. Helping from occupation science, helping us understand and consider practice in other ways. Okay, so the first example of some of my research around ideas of, of occupation science and occupation I'd like to mention is um, my doctoral research that I conducted when I was living in Greece, and that was, I think, very much about what is occupation and is occupation a universal concept. I, it was um, in teaching in, in the Greek context I was very much challenged sometimes by trying to translate not just literally into the Greek language but also into the Greek uh, culture and context um, some of the concepts around occupation. So what is meaning? Uh, we wouldn't really talk about mean, meaning we wouldn't use the word for meaning in Greek in the same way as it is in, in the English language. So, so what does that mean for, for our understandings of occupation? Um, and it was I, I was looking at occupation in the general population. What is occupation? How do we understand daily life? But and particularly around how do we live healthy daily lives? Because at that time I felt that a lot of occupational science theory was around what a healthy daily life. How is occupation linked to health? So those were the interests. And from that research, um, I think there were three things that maybe just very briefly are of interest. One was um, regarding uh, that occupation was taking place at three levels simultaneously for most people. One was to do with the self and the person themselves. One was to do with the family and how they occupation in relation to family members, family networks, family occupation. And the third level was in occupation in relation to the collective, to the public space of the community. Um, and the people were engaged in occupation at all those three levels. Um, and even in relation to the, the, the self, um, the self was conceptualized quite clearly, not in terms of just the, the physical self and the body that needed care, which obviously is part of sort of what how perhaps the Canadian model would describe self-care, um, but it was also to do with the, the soul and the spirit and how do we take care of our emotional needs um, and how do we take care of our spiritual needs and what do we do for those. And then family, care, cousins, children, parents, lots of doings and beings in relation to those people and then in the public space of being a citizen, being a part of that. And that, in some ways, links to some uh, another area of interest, which I think is this idea of the public space and citizenship, um, which is work we're doing with a, a group from the European, uh, from Enode, um, and that's looking at not citizenship as a uh, the relationship between the individual and the state, as that can be um, named with a passport and, and identity documents but to do with the relationships of fellow citizens between each other and sort of mutual responsibility for how we live together and the public world that we create. Um, and I think that's very interesting for occupational therapy too because I think certainly in the UK we tend to focus on even people with long-term disabilities and medical conditions we're often very interested in their personal um, occupations to do with self-care, to do with going back into employment, but we less re frequently look at um, how are they involved in the public world? Are they able 
to be part of um, celebratory events? Are they able to go to a football match or to a, to a, a club, at, in, in, which would be a sort of celebratory collective occupation in, in certainly urban society in Northern Europe? Or are they able to be part of a local association that's or, or local government? You know, are they able to take on roles and responsibilities around the, the public world? So this idea of citizenship, I think, is very useful too. Um, also for working with communities, um, the idea of working together as fellow citizens, um, and perhaps also as a useful perspective to think of in terms of client-centered. Are we, if we're client-centered, but our first time as fellow citizen with my client. So what does that mean for our relationship as people in the world together before we enter into this potential power dynamic of I have the expertise and the client is being treated. But that's a probably mm -hmm. a different story. And um, the final bit of research that I'm involved in, which I think uh, hopefully will be interesting, is looking at um, occupation at uh, a social level and how we can transform communities or policy to to tackle issues of discrimination and inequality, poverty, um, and there we're, we are um, interviewing various people involved in occupation-based projects, because we do feel that occupation is a mechanism for change, whether that's on an individual basis or whether it's on a collective basis. Um, so the potential, for example, I have just recently interviewed a a project that's used football with homeless people and through the occupation of playing football and becoming football players they are able to re-engage with aspects of society that actually had rejected them for many years and become more organized and find skills and gain confidence and act as role models in the communities that they were coming from of quite deprived areas um, so we see there the power of occupation to enable change, both at the individual level, but also at the community level. And those those um, cases will be um, uh, published in the next year or so, um, giving examples of uh, occupation-based social transformation. Okay. So um, how do we teach about occupation and occupation science? Um, in, in the, I'll talk first about our undergraduate program uh, that we have at the university and occupation is very much a thread throughout the whole of the program and in fact when we were designing the program we had sort of across years what's going to happen each year but then we also had some horizontal uh, vertical threads and one was occupation how is it going to be introduced how will it be sort of ensured that it's there the whole time so we, the, the, the students in their first year, we have a whole module, um, which is called the occupational, um, uh, humans as occupational beings, uh, which they take in the first year as a, a module, and they look at their own occupations, and they have to give a talk about an occupation that they engage with. We ask them to keep, make a portfolio, recording the, an occupation that they and reflecting on what that means for them and presenting it in quite a creative way usually. Um, we talk about how to develop an occupational profile of somebody, how to get to know somebody as an occupational being, how to hear stories about their lives and we ask them to do that with a friend or a relative. So we spend quite a lot of time looking at people as occupational beings before we look at people as with medical conditions or people who they're going to come in contact and work with. And, and then really we start when those are introduced um, and we do talk about medical conditions and we talk about neurological issues and mental illness but we, uh, we are often looking at the impact of those in terms of occupations. So what would that, that condition mean for this person as an, as an occupational being? Um, and, and the work with them and <clears throat> being around occupation and occupation as a medium for, for intervention as well as a, as a, a goal. Um, 
We always expect their assignments. We usually they usually have written assignments or presentations, and we would be expecting those to be always have an occupation focus um, as a sort of core requirement. So somebody who just came and talked about cardiac problems and exercise without any reflection or relation to occupation would not probably pass the assignment. So that's a core criteria. Um, so we're always looking at occupational therapy through an occupational lens. We do do work around uh, occupational deprivation. We very much present difficulties with occupation around as um, either occupational deprivation or occupational disruption. So often medical illnesses we frame as a disruption um, and then more the long-term societal influences as deprivation. And we use those sort of two terms as framings of the kind of things that we may be working with as occupational therapists. Um, we also have a master's program. Um, we have one module there which is on occupational science, um, which is an introduction to all key concepts around occupational science. And the final assignment is uh, asking them to take uh, current issue in society that influ is influencing the health or well-being of populations and to look at it through the lens of an occupational science concept. So they might look at um, loneliness in, 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 as a societal problem and look at it through the perspective of it could be belonging or it could be um, occupational deprivation or it could be alienation. They can choose what what's the lens that they would bring to that um, and we have a that then is followed by a second module where they <coughs> really because and that's where they will be the students taking that module will be occupational therapists so we encourage them to what would changing your practice to have an occupational focus look like <coughs> what are the challenges to that so critiquing modules models critiquing theory and they, <coughs> excuse me, the final, the final assignment is suggesting change. This is the current situation. This is how we could view it from an occupational based perspective. How can we change practice to bring that in? Um, so those are the main ways that we, we engage in educational processes around occupation, occupational science.